seventeenth lesson looks at attacking the boss system, and we drill down here um, on something that we talked about a few lessons back when we looked at the success, at least initial success, of progressives at the local level. Because of course, attacking the boss system in municipal politics is very much a, a local affair. But I drilled down on this particularly in this lesson because it's come up in past paper questions before, and it can be you know a very convenient ten marker talking about the uh, the effects of the progressives at attacking the boss system, for instance. And it's worth a look at. Um, um, if not uh, in in in, you know, in a little bit of greater detail. So what are we going to how what and how are we going to start? Well, let's give a couple examples of what the bosses were at their best or worst, if you want to say that that way. The best example and the most well known example um, is Boss Tweed. He becomes sort of the the personification of everything wrong with the boss system of America. He's the, the, the lasting icon of the boss system. He's um, effectively the the boss of, of New York City. Um, he was described at the time as 240 pounds of rascality. Um, he employed bribery, graft, fraudulent elections to milk New York City of more than $200 million in those days money, um, approaching a billion if you want to talk about it in today's money. And some of the examples of his, his uh, corruption are, are incredible. The New York uh, Public Library, for instance, supposed to be um, constructed at uh, the cost of around a million dollars, overran by $13 million as Boss Tweed raked in those profits, basically back to himself. Some of the examples of how he got away with the corruption, um, and I'm going to use um, uh, our, our, let's just say, um, I'm going to use sort of modern currency examples. He played a plaster or somebody to do the plaster work inside the New York Public Library, a, uh, approximately $4.9 million for one month's work. And of course, the plaster would keep a little, a little bit of that. The majority of that would get kicked back to Boss Tweed. Another example was a carpenter in the same building project getting paid for a month's work around $2 million, and it's more correctly $1.9 million in today's money. Um, and that's just an, an example of how Boss Tweed got away with it. Um, cost overruns on city finances, um, or cost overruns on city projects, um, buying up land and selling it off at extortionate prices. Boss Tweed had his hand in just about everything. And as a result, people, well, both liked him and resented him. Um, I'll come to sort of the of the irony of, of this whole boss system in a second, but just a couple points of, uh, of note. Uh, the New York Times basically makes it his life to... Um, take down Boss Tweed. Uh, article after article exposing the corruption of the Boss system. Tweed in particular leads to Tweed being eventually arrested. A um, couple, couple more points on that. The cartoonist Thomas Nast, not Nast, Nast, um, Thomas Nast, um, who portray or put does cartoons in the New York Times and also in the famous National Weekly, Harper's Weekly, um, basically makes it his life mission to destroy Boss Tweed. And Tweed will actually complain about Nass pictures by saying, um, the illiterate minions who vote for me could not help but see those damn pictures, and those damn pictures brought me down. Tweed was, Tweed was jailed actually twice. He escapes uh, the first time. Um, he, he flees to Spain. He ends up working on a trawler in the 1870s off the coast of Spain. Before rec He was actually recognized, coincidentally, by border officials who had seen Thomas Ness's portrayals of Boss Tweed, and they turned him over to an American military ship called the USS Franklin, which um, returns Tweed to prison where he dies behind bars. Just uh, an interesting side note on Boss Tweed, but you get massive corruption. Now, just to one other thing, you may be thinking to yourself, well, you know, why did so many people vote for him, even if everybody knew he was corrupt, even if they were illiterate, they knew he was corrupt? Well, the thing is, Boss Tweed's legacy is an interesting one, and historians have been relatively kind to Boss Tweed lately. Um, at least, you know, no one denies his corruption and the whole horrible graft and thievery and fraudulent elections. I mean, one of the facts I mentioned in here is the fact that if you didn't like Boss Tweed, your property taxes would become astronomical, so much so that you would go bankrupt and Boss Tweed would take your house. Those types of things happen. But on the other hand, um, Boss Tweed pioneers huge um, improvement projects, not only in the city of New York, also nationally. He pays for some of the earliest parks. He ensures um, educational provisions. He provides some of the earliest teacher colleges in the state of New York. He gives Christmas dinner to the poor. And the poor, really much hanging on the edge of life, who seem very distant from, you know, let's say, the, the rough and tumble world of internal New York politics, actually like Boss Tweed. So there's that sort of, you know, uh, 
you know, he's a criminal, but he's our criminal, and Boss Tweed and bosses around uh, around the country like him uh, get away with it. That said, by the end of the Gilded Age and into the Progressive Era, their time was up. One of the best examples is um, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, and this he writes about the meatpacking industry predominantly in Chicago. Very interesting about Sinclair's The Jungle. Um, Sinclair had hoped that the book itself would, um, in the early part of the 20th century, illuminate the horrendous nature of internal Chicago politics um, by doing effectively a case study of the meatpacking districts. What it actually did more than uh, illuminate the corruption in Chicago politics was illuminate the horrors of the meatpacking industry and lead to higher quality standards for America's meat. But I'll let you read this uh, on boss Mike Scully, but Mike Scully is your sort of atypical um, the boss, and it talks about in Sinclair's Jungle very, very vividly how he basically runs all Chicago elections for the Democratic Party, very similar to Boss Tweed's Tammany Hall, which had run the um, the New York uh, run New York City on behalf of the Democratic Party. Um, so, what did the bosses do? Let's just sum it up. Number one, they trade jobs for services and votes. A powerful boss could claim the loyalty of thousands and thousands of followers. And in return for support, the boss provides these people with jobs on the city's payroll. They find housing for new arrivals. They give uh, the needy gifts of food, particularly around holidays. Um, the bosses are, um, for instance, in the Jewish areas of town, they're, uh, they provide food for Jewish holidays. Um, in the Christian areas of town, they provide holidays. Uh, food for things like Christmas dinner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They patch up minor run-ins with the law, so you have a small problem with the law, fine, you can't pay uh, uh, a small altercation that needs to be dealt with. The boss would ensure that that comes off the docket, and in, in return, you'd better vote for them. They help get some schools, hospitals, and parks built in immigrant neighborhoods. Now, of course, immigrants ultimately like the boss system in a sense, but at the same time, the progressive reformers, and you got to remember this is coming from the middle class, the people who don't need the boss's helps, hate what they would refer to as the cynical exploitation of the immigrant vote. Um, they saw this as a, a bastardization of uh, the American Jeffersonian ideal, the American dream, okay? And for this reason, the corrupt boss system, if you will, um, comes under attack, but also, um, because the boss system is somewhat valuable, means that it lasts longer than it probably otherwise should. One of the first to attack the bosses was fighting Bob LaFollette of Wisconsin through his Wisconsin idea. Again, something we talked about a couple lessons ago. Bob LaFollette um, gained a pretty wide following nationwide for um, pushing through important reforms that came to be known as the Wisconsin idea. Of course, the reforms that you know, meant to reform the boss system is the direct primary so that people like um, Boss Tweed wouldn't be automatically voted in by cronies. He would be um, the people who would take his position or take the mayoral positions in cities, for instance, would be nominated for office. He wanted tax reform, which included the taxation of corporate profits, railroad rate control, public utilities, and other measures. But in regards to um, it, uh, the bosses, it's all about how these people get elected. Now, another way that the boss system was tackled, and we've talked about this again in, in brief, was the establishment of a commission in the city manager. Um, a city manager is someone who is appointed with a specific power. They work with police, fire, and education chiefs, and they're accountable to uh, an elected body. This was essentially designed to remove party politics from lo local services and to break the boss system in many cities so that the public administration of the city becomes a um, not affiliated, um, uh, a not affiliated um, politically organization. So, in other words, it breaks the hold of the Democratic and Republican parties, which, of course, in, in and of themselves, um, appoint their candidates through cronyism rather than through um, other means. So, therefore, by putting the city's actual running in the hands of um, experts or um, perceived experts, the boss system is, some, is broken. One of the best examples is, of course, firstly, Galveston, Texas. So how does the commission work? Well, the commission plan was a reorganization of city government. 
all the city functions are controlled by a small group of elected citizens known as the commission. And each commissioner was responsible for one particular department. So for instance, there'd be a commissioner of public works, there'd be a commissioner of transport, there'd be a commissioner of parks. And collectively, they make overall policy for the cities. And since all of the commissioners were theoretically equal, there wasn't one boss, it diminished the possibility of one overpowerful figure dominating the city as mayor, as was the case in Chicago or New York City for that matter. Um, the city manager is an idea that was uh, developed in a place called Staunton, Virginia, uh, but popularized in, by the city of Dayton, Ohio, a sizable city in, in southeastern Ohio. Uh, the city manager acts, for instance, as the overall runner of a city. So the elected commission or the commissioners act more as a board of directors. They appoint a non-political, completely unaffiliated city manager who ha would have the, hopefully anyway, the skills and expertise to manage the city as a business rather than a political fiefdom. And through these plans, um, the boss or the influence of an individual person was removed. Okay, um, They didn't work everywhere, but they did take um, huge chunks out of the control of municipal affairs of the boss system, okay? And these are really, let's just say, early attempts of professionalizing city management to something we'd be more akin to seeing today. Another way, and so this is the key linchpin of the Wisconsin idea, was the idea of the direct primary, okay? Party bosses had traditionally been pre-selected. The candidates, um, uh, but as candidates well in advance, and they use the sort of the nominating convention, which all parties do, to impose their will and influence. Now, the primary election or the preliminary election, voters nominate directly the candidate they'd like to see run, and anyone can be nominated. Therefore, if somebody is popular, um, has support within a local group or a local community, they can be put up for election. It actually also helps in a great deal getting immigrants to have a voice. You start to see large cities putting in um, with uh, non-native mayors. New York, for instance, I think of LaGuardia, one of the most famous uh, mayors of New York City, comes up this way. Now, LaGuardia is really technically connected with Tammany Hall, but it's, um, let's just say, reduced in, in its influence at this particular point. And of course, all of this serves to make government much, much more responsive than it ever had been to the will of the people, which can arguably be a good thing and does reduce the uh, the break in the boss, uh, the, uh, the boss system. Federal civil service re response. So what was the response of America to the growing corruption of the political process? Um, most of the change, as I said, as I just demonstrated, comes from the local level, but I would be remiss to say that the federal government um, stayed out of it entirely. Now, the federal civil service reform is extraordinarily minor, okay? Um, one of the things that, I guess, pushes for it is that people like Thomas Nast work to bring justice to people like uh, the Tweed Ring. So one way uh, that sort of pushes it is the fact that the government can no longer ignore, particularly when you have high-profile criminal cases such as that of Boss Tweed, the problems, okay? And another, and therefore, they need to, uh, they, they feel, I guess, under increasing public pressure to institute federal civil service reform. Now, what does all this mean? Well, of course, the civil service are those who work for the federal government. Um, many of the people around the president were implicated in major scandals from the end of Reconstruction onwards. Uh, I had mentioned uh, uh, lessons ago, and you probably don't remember, and, you know, it's not ultimately that important, but for instance, Ulysses S. Grant's presidency towards the end of the Reconstruction period was marred by huge corruption scandals as many of the people around him um, were involved in the credit mobilier construction scandal. That's just one example. Um, but all, how and why that happens has everything to do with the fact that government jobs are granted as a reward for political support. And the situation that brings all of this ahead to a head and perhaps leads to um, civil service reform in some respects is the assassination of James Garfield in 1881. Now, fascinating story this. And I, I can go into greater detail um, about how crazy the guy who shot Garfield was, but I, I won't I won't waste your time this evening. What I will say is that um, in 1881, James Garfield was assassinated by a man named Charles Guiteau, and Charles Guiteau was um, an American-born Frenchman who was certifiably insane, and he had been a volunteer and a large contributor, um, mostly by donating his family's money to the campaign of, of Garfield. 
Guiteau expected unwilling, un unnecessarily in many ways, that because of his support for Garfield, um, uh, that he would be made ambassador of France. And of course, when this didn't happen, he flew into a murderous rage and shot uh, Garfield uh, not very far from the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Garfield uh, lasted, yeah, I think he lasted about less than a day, bleeding and in a pretty horrible shape. Anyways, he dies. He's replaced by President uh, Arthur, Chester A. Arthur, who was the vice president. And Arthur really takes upon Garfield's major legacy. And as a consequence of his death, passes through really what becomes known as the only way to, uh, the only civil service reform. That's the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act of 1883. And this was meant to end what we should know as the spoil system, the idea that the to the victor go the spoils, i.e. if you support the victor, then the spoils of war go to you, i.e. jobs. Now, the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act um, institutes jobs given on merit. So it becomes illegal to give jobs to people who are unqualified for it. So somebody like Charles Guito, who has no experience in the diplomatic corps, could not necessarily become ambassador of France, for example. Um, it also prevents employees from getting fired on their political views. One way that corruption reigned within the federal civil service was that the election of a new president, especially if that president was from another party, would ultimately lend into a culling of the civil service so that the civil service aligns with the views of the incoming administration. No other reform after this is attempted at the federal level. And large part, actually, very interestingly, with all of this stuff, it takes usually the assassination of a president for anything, you know, marginally progressive to happen. And I suppose you could argue that Garfield and uh, and uh, McKinley are in the same thing. Of course, Garfield is followed by Arthur, who puts in the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act, and McKinley's assassination is followed by Roosevelt, who himself institutes some progressive ideology. It's just an interesting point. I don't know if it's exam relevant, but it's interesting, well, to me anyway. The last thing I'm going to say for today's lesson is this. Was bossism curbed? Now, the answer is not really. The boss system effectively continues in major cities until the 1950s with limiting impact. Um, some historians argue the diminishing impact of bosses, ha bosses had much to do with the reforms passed in the progressive era or by the progressives than other things. Um, the the counter-arguments to that is the fact that in New York City, for instance, Tammany Hall supported prohibition, and the prohibition was massively unpopular. And as a result, the Tammany Hall boss system that had run New York fell out of favor with people because they were no longer willing to give their votes, that's to say, in return for a turkey dinner because they'd taken away their booze. So that didn't really go very well. And as a result, you see the boss system curb from the 19, late 1910s into the 1920s dramatically because the Tammany Hall machine was associated with the unpopularity of prohibition. Another major thing was the move to the suburbs. Of course, the move to the suburbs increases the power of the inner city. Bosses had their power bases in the overly populated, the densely populated inner cities. When people start moving out to the suburbs as a consequence of reliable transport, more money, etc., etc., the suburbs become big and powerful in municipal government, therefore reducing the impact of the inner city, densely populated boroughs. So uh, that reduces, of course, the power of the boss who have their power base within the sort of the cramped inner city bureaus. And the last one is a general decrease in immigration to the inner cities. Most of the migration in America into the inner cities after the progressive era, or certainly after the First World War, is internal migration, largely African-American, African-Americans moving from the south into the inner cities. And you could argue that there are some racist motives to that, as bosses just generally stopped caring. Uh, there's a difference between, I suppose, white and black people in the eyes of some, some, and, you know, though that's hard to prove, there is certainly a direct influence that, you know, the power of the inner cities decreases when the immigrants start moving out of these, the sort of the white immigrants moving out and the black people move in. Something to consider. Anyhow, was bossism curved? There were some steps. Um, they happened more successfully at the local level, but it takes a long time to die out. Think you got that? I think you got that. That's all I have to say for today. Anyways, thanks for listening.